Chapter Thirteen of the Diamond Cross Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. The Diamond Cross Mystery by Chester K. Steele. Chapter Thirteen. Singer Foot. Mr. Ketteridge, his eyes big with unconcealed wonder as he looked at the odd coin, was eager to accost Harry King at once, and demand to know whence the roisterer had obtained it. In fact, the jeweler half arose from his chair to approach the three swaggering men in the café section of the grill, when Colonel Ashley laid a restraining hand on the shoulder of his new friend. "'It won't do now,' he said gently. "'Why not?' I've got to find out how he came by that coin. It's a rare and valuable one, I tell you. It's worth all of a thousand dollars to a collector. Lots of them would be glad to pay more. Its catalog price is a thousand. And now this drunken fool has it. He must. Colonel, don't you see what this means? Yes, Mr. Ketteridge, I can very easily see what it might mean. But King is in no condition now to approach on such a subject. There is a saying that when the wine is in, the wit is out, and it is generally held by some detectives that then is the proper time to approach a subject for information that would otherwise be withheld. But King is in a sarcastic mood now, and sufficiently able to take care of himself to be very suspicious if we begin to question him, even under the guise of friendship. I suppose so, agreed the jeweler, and yet... "'Oh, I wish I hadn't got into this,' suddenly exclaimed Colonel Ashley, with almost a despairing gesture. "'I started out for some quiet fishing, which I very much needed, for I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. I ought never to have undertaken it. I'm almost resolved to give it up. I believe I will,' he said suddenly, slapping his hand on the table, at the sound of which a waiter hurried up. "'No, nothing now,' went on the Colonel, waving the man away. "'Yes, I'll give this case up,' he went on with a sigh. "'In the morning I'll get Shag to lay out my rods and we'll go fishing. "'I was foolish to let myself be dragged into this. "'It would have been all right five years ago. "'But now, well, I'm through, that's all.' "'Mr. Ketteridge regarded his companion with amazement. "'But what can we do without you?' he asked. "'Oh, I'll send you one of my best men,' was the answer. I'll wire for Kedge. You can rely on him. He's solved more cases like this than I can remember. Yes, I'll send for Kedge. This is no place for me. I'm too old. Too old, Colonel? Yes, too old, and I've grown too fond of fishing. Yes, I'll let Kedge finish this up. And yet... The detective seemed to muse for a moment. Then he went on, half murmuring to himself. No, hang it all. Kedge has that bank case to look after. Anyhow, I don't believe he'd figure this out right. Oh, well, I suppose there's no help for it. I've got to keep on now that I've started. But it's my last case, positively my last case. And once more he banged his hand down on the table. Again the waiter glided up. He looked at the colonel expectantly, and the latter stared at him uncomprehendingly for a moment. "'Oh, yes,' went on the detective. "'You may bring me, er, just a small glass of claret, a very small one.' Mr. Ketteridge gave his order and then looked relieved. The colonel had seemed very much in earnest. "'Do you suppose,' asked the jeweler, "'that Harry King could have had anything to do with this case?' "'Of course it's possible, but even so we can easily make sure of him and arrest him when we want him. To approach him now would only be to defeat your own plan.' that is if you have one i confess this startles me i don't know what to make of it and there's no use pretending that i do after all detective work is the outcome of common sense plus a sort of special intuition and knowledge i have gotten to a certain point and now some of my theories are shattered that is they would be if i had been foolish enough to have formed arbitrary theories that could not be changed as it is that's just what i have not done I am still open to argument and conviction, 
and this coin which you say belonged to mrs darcy a few days before her death and which now makes its appearance in the hands of a drunken man who has been under suspicion makes cause for question but my dear mr ketteridge let us be reasonable king will not run away and in his present condition he is likely to pick a quarrel with you if you mention the murder to him consider also that it may be he came into possession of this coin honestly how he may have received it in change here he spent enough money in the place i suppose but if he got it here great scott you don't suppose that larch i don't suppose anything yet least of all regarding larch but consider this is a public place hundred persons yes two or three hundred come in here every day spend money and receive change now this coin though to you and me it shows itself at once to be of great antiquity might easily be passed in a hurry or to one who had not the full possession of his senses as a silver half dollar which it somewhat resembles in fact i think i can persuade king that it was a half dollar he dropped and somewhat to the surprise of mr ketteridge the colonel who had been watching king as the latter sought on the floor for his fallen coins walked up to the wastrel and handed him a fifty-cent piece you dropped that i believe said colonel ashley genial enough thanks old top perhaps i did have a drink no thank you with a friendly wave of his hand to the colonel king slipped the half dollar into his pocket with other loose change and turned to the glass that awaited him you see said the colonel to mr ketteridge he doesn't know he had it he doesn't know he lost it he doesn't know you have it keep it i beg of you we may need it but suppose king goes away he won't i'll take care of that i'll telegraph for one of my best men i have a little more than i can look after personally what do you intend to do have king kept in sight there are some others in this city i need to shadow you don't mean sing a foot no he's in custody besides i've well i guess i won't say what conclusion i've come to regarding him i might have to change it he is an interesting study i haven't yet found a motive for his killing of his partner if he did it who else could there might be many just as there might be many ways to account for kings having possession of this coin he may have come by it in a way that is easily explained and if we inferentially accused him there would be trouble i suppose so well colonel ashley i'll leave the case in your hands god knows for the sake of the family name i'd like to see darcy cleared i don't believe he did it here you keep this coin for the detective had offered it to his companion you may need it yes i may and so it is worth a thousand dollars mused the colonel just about the sum darcy claimed from his cousin i wonder oh but what's the use of wondering i must make certain and he put the old roman coin safely away in his wallet the colonel and his friend finished their modest meal and their more modest potations of no very strong liquids and went out leaving harry king and his companions to make a night of it larch whose face was unusually flushed was endeavouring to bring the young man to a less boisterous state for he realized that his better class of patrons did not like this sort of thing but king was in jubilant mood he had been released under heavy bail it is true when the hotel keeper gave a pledge for the appearance of the young man when he was wanted harry was only held as a witness so far but an important one and because of his known characteristic of suddenly disappearing at times a heavy bond had been required why larch had gone on this bond did not make itself clear to colonel ashley and he set that down in his little red notebook as one of the matters needing to be cleared up and so wondering much the colonel and mr ketteridge the former with the rare coin went out into the cool and starlit night leaving behind them the sounds of good fellowship of that particular brand in the homestead one of the first places the colonel visited the next day was the jewelry shop matters there had nearly assumed their normal aspect 
trade was about the same under the skilful management of mr ketteridge and the cut glass and silver gleamed and glistened in the showcases as though the former owner of it all had not been cruelly slain show you her collection of coins certainly agreed mr ketteridge when the colonel told what he wanted as i said i saw them and particularly the one we picked up last night in her safe a week or so before she was killed i was on for a visit and i know that a week previous to that she had refused a thousand dollars for this particular one these coins were one of her hobbies and he brought from the safe the collection which was of considerable value to a numismatist there seemed to be others besides the roman coin gone said the jeweller for i now miss minnie i used to see in her case but of course she may have sold them i do remember the one king had though and i'm sure she never sold that it was taken close to the time she was killed colonel ashley taking advantage of the time when the store was closed for the night minutely examined the safe but could find no evidence of its having been tampered with for what started out to be a simple murder case mused the old detective as he went back to his hotel that night this one bids fair to become quite complicated an impulse it was hardly more than that and yet it had to do with the matter in hand sent the detective to police headquarters i think i'll ask donovan what singerfoot said when he was arrested and charged with murdering his partner said the colonel to himself there's an end i haven't developed very much and i would like to ask that east indian something about that queer watch donovan was at headquarters it being his night on and he welcomed the detective as some one with whom he might hold converse have a talk with sing afoot why sure if it'll do you any good said the headquarters man when the colonel had made known his desire i was going to the jail on another matter anyhow and i might as well kill two birds as one they'll let you see him if i'm with you otherwise you'd have to get an order from the prosecutor's office come along it was raining when they reached the jail and the colonel as he heard the patter of drops thought of the night he had first come to colchester there ought to be good fishing after this rain said the colonel with a regretful sigh as he thought of his rods and flies fishing exclaimed donovan say that's something i haven't done since i was a kid i used to like it though well here we are looks like a party what do you suppose the warden's all lit up for certainly the gloomy jail was more brightly lighted than usual at night for the prisoners were locked in their cells and all illumination save the keeper's lights put out at nine o'clock we want to see that dago you know sing a foot said donovan as he nodded to the deputy warden who answered their ring at the steel side door hm a little too late was the answer too late what do you mean he's gone that's it on bail no it couldn't be with a murder charge expostulated donovan he can't be out you're kidding he's croaked answered the deputy warden we found him dead in his cell half an hour ago End of chapter 13 recording by james o'connor randolph massachusetts may 2011